We're talking with Dr. James Shumia, a board certified pulmonologist, and we're gonna be talking about chronic bronchitis, emphysema, COPD. James, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you. Tell me, is there a difference in those three words, chronic bronchitis, COPD, and emphysema? There is a difference. There's a lot of overlap, but there's a difference. COPD stands for chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Right. Okay. And that is a, a disorder of airflow, and that airflow problem can lead to shortness of breath and can cause problems with cough over time. Chronic bronchitis is defined as if you're having cough for three months a year for two years in a row, and you've ruled out all the other common causes of cough, then you have chronic bronchitis. Is there something characteristic about that cough of chronic bronchitis? You tend to bring up a lot of phlegm in pro chronic bronchitis, and sometimes you can have a hard time bringing that phlegm up. Three months, two successive years. That's right. And that makes the doctor think about the diagnosis. Does that establish the diagnosis? It does not establish the diagnosis of and, COPD or chronic bronchitis. And emphysema? Emphysema is uh, a damage to the architecture of the lung where the air spaces become bigger and it's also damage to the lining of the lung and that lining is important because that's how where oxygen goes from the air, crosses into the lung and gets into the blood. So how is the diagnosis made of these three overlapping illnesses? The, well, the first thing is that you need to speak with your physician about just respiratory symptoms because a lot of times people underappreciate problems they may be having. So if you're having respiratory symptoms, you should discuss them with your physician. Like what? Respiratory symptoms. What so one would be if you cough more days than you don't, even when you're not sick and you bring up a lot of phlegm. Uh, another symptom is shortness of breath. And uh, a shortness of breath can be really subtle in the beginning. Maybe you're having a hard time gardening or you're having difficulty going up that flight of stairs that wasn't so hard a year ago. And a lot of people tend to say, well, I'm just getting older or I'm out of shape, but it may truly be an important symptom that needs further attention. And how is the diagnosis established? You've taken the history, then what do you do? If you suspect COPD, you order a test called a spirometry. And spirometry. spirometry. Now, that's a big medical word. What does it mean? What it means is there's a, a device. Uh, it's, a, it's about a five-minute test, and the patient basically blows into a device, and that device can sense how fast the air is flowing. And since COPD is a disorder of airflow and, a, and an obstruction of airflow, the, the machine gives us a printout, and your physician can look at it and see if you meet the criteria for COPD. If somebody's got chronic bronchitis, do they have airflow problems also? Some may, uh, not everyone. Uh, over time, if you have enough uh, secretions in the airway, if your airway is scarred down or maybe you have swelling in the airway, that can lead to blockage of airflow. Emphysema, is that blockage of airflow? Emphysema causes airflow problems from a, in a different way. Uh, basically, normal lungs are like rubber bands, and after you take a deep breath, they kind of snap back closed. But if you have emphysema, th that's, that's no longer the case, and the lung can't snap back. And so instead of the lung pushing that air out when it snaps back, it ends up trapping air, and a, and a lung with too much air doesn't function very well. And that spirometry, or that five-minute lung test, that can differentiate between the three frequently? Well, it, it defines COPD. If you have a blockage of airflow, then you'll have COPD. It's really more up to the, what the information your physician obtained, as well as looking at, at x-rays and CAT scans and things like that to further differentiate. The, one thing that's helpful, though, is the treatment often is very similar regardless of whether you, you say you have chronic bronchitis or emphysema or COPD. The treatment's often the same, and a lot of people will use those words interchangeably, even though they really are different. What's the main cause of chronic bronchitis COPD? The number one cause is exposure to cigarette smoke, cigarette smoking. There are definitely other causes, but that studies have shown that's far and away the number one cause. How does the cigarette smoking damage the lungs? What does it do? Well, it, it can do a variety of things. First of all, it can cause inflammation in the bronchial tubes or the lining of the lung, and that can lead to, to some scarring over time. Another thing is that cigarette smoking tends, you end up having more mucus cells, mucus secreting cells, and so smokers, even if they don't have COPD, 
produce a lot more mucus than non-smokers, and so there's a lot more coughing up of that mucus. But over time, that mucus can lead to chronic bronchitis and COPD. Is that mucus a nice culture media for bacteria? It can be. Do absolutely. you get a lot of infections when you got chronic bronchitis and COPD? You can have recurrent problems with infections. Require some people. That would be another indicator. If you're requiring antibiotics multiple times a year for bronchitis, there may be something else going on there. This mucus that's produced with somebody that's a cigarette smoker, uh, how does it get out of the lungs other than just right. <laughs> coughing? So in, in normal healthy lungs, you have cells that line the lungs that have tiny little hairs on them called cilia. And those little hairs are constantly beating toward your mouth. And their purpose is to keep the mucus moving upward to make it easier once it gets close to the top to cough it up. Cigarette smoking, however, really can damage those cells, damage those little hairs, paralyze those little hairs. And so that, that is not only can make cough more burdensome, but it can be a setup for infection if you can't clear that stuff up. Yeah, so about the only way that you can clear it up is by coughing if those cilia aren't working. That's right. Can you get them to work good? If you stop smoking, the cilia can improve. But an important thing to remember is that those cells, they can regenerate, but it takes some time. So if you stopped smoking three weeks ago and you're still coughing, don't lose hope. It may take some time before those cilia really pick up steam again. James, great discussion on chron chronic bronchitis and COPD. How really serious a problem is this? This is a pretty serious issue. Um, COPD is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. Fourth it, leading cause Fourth of leading cause. And so it's something that when people think about heart disease and other things that are real prominent, they don't think about COPD as much. And the other important fact is that if you look at the other major leading causes of death, the frequency of those has been de decreasing over the past two decades. But the, the problems with COPD have actually been on the rise. Why? Uh, part of it is that new interventions have come about for those other conditions that have really changed the scope of care. And although we've made advances in how we take care of people with COPD, uh, there's not been some sort of earth shattering new thing that has affected uh, how, the, how folks may do. And so it's really important that we do what we can to prevent the disease, treat the disease early, things like that. And you talked about the cigarettes and how they damage the lungs and how they cause inflammation and mucus secretion and they damage these little cilia. It sounded scary to me. Uh, tell me about stopping smoking. Is that an important part of the treatment? It, it's a critical part. And, and the reason it's so important is it has more of an impact over time than just about anything else. Everybody as they age, they lose a little bit of lung function each year. But in COPD, you lose more function each year. And, and so if you continue to smoke, your lung function is just declining, declining, declining. If you stop smoking? If you it? stop smoking, the decline kind of levels off. Okay? Ah, so and there's no medicine, there's nothing else I can do that will allow it to level off like that. So it's so important. Difficult to stop smoking, it's an, a, nicotine is addictive. Some people just can't stop smoking. Right. How do you, tell the patient to stop smoking well, gracefully. The first thing is that the person has to be motivated because there isn't a cessation aid or, or medication in the world that will help if the person really isn't motivated. If they're motivated, then we have a combination of counseling. Uh, we, we counsel them about nic using nicotine replacement, which can be usually obtained over the counter. And then there's some medications that you can use. Those medications do have some side effects potentially. And so I think it's important that you have a good discussion with your doctor to determine if the medications are right for you. Successful in getting people to stop smoking? Absolutely. I, I've, uh, of course, I see uh, people with issues with smoking all the time and uh, we've successfully helped a lot of people stop smoking. Do you see a difference it makes in their life if they're able to stop smoking? It makes a huge difference and it's not just the smoking doesn't just pose the risk for lung disease. There are multiple different health effects of cigarette smoking. And another very important point is a lot of people who ultimately are successful at stopping smoking have had multiple failed attempts before they stop. And so just because you haven't been successful the three times you've tried before, you may be successful this next time. That's such an important statement to make. It's always important to try that next time because one of these days you're gonna be successful right. in stopping smoking. Right. And you do see improvement when some are 
Loss of decline. Loss of decline. Lev things level off. What is the treatment uh, other than stopping smoking? What do you do for these people? There's a variety of different things you can do. I mean, first of all, certainly there's medications. Most of the medications we use for COPD are inhaled medications. Then there's something called pulmonary rehab. Let's go to those inhaled okay. medications. What are some of them and how do they work? There are kind of two general classes of inhalers. One are called bronchodilators, and, and their function is to try to open up that bronchial tube if it's constricted down. And if you open up the bronchial tube, then you'll have less problems with airflow. And it lets you cough up some of that mucus that may be trapped. Right, and it, and it allows you to, to do more and become less short of breath. So they're important. Bronchodilators. Right. What else? The other major class are steroid inhalers, and steroids are, are have anti-inflammatory properties. And since uh, COPD definitely has an inflammatory component to it, if you deliver a medicine that's anti-inflammatory to the bronchial tubes and to the lungs, then that may settle down some of that inflammation. People don't like the word steroids, but it's pretty well proven that the inhaled steroids at a proper dose are safe. That's right. That's right. You just uh, you need to do certain things like making sure you rinse your mouth out well after you use them. Why? Uh, you, you can get some irritation or even uh, a, a fungal infection in your mouth if you're not really careful about washing out your mouth. So you mentioned bronchodilators and you mentioned inhaled steroids. What about combination of both of them? There are a variety of products that uh, combine a bronchodilator. Uh, common names you may have heard, uh, I mean, combine a bronchodilator and steroid. You may have heard of Advair or Symbicort. Those are they are, good? They're, they're, very, they're very good. Now, they're not for everybody with COPD. Some patients with milder COPD may not require those. Another inhaler you may have heard of is called Spiriva. It is, it is a, a long-acting bronchodilator. It acts for 24 hours, and it provides some opening for those bronchial tubes during that Do you time. like one or the other, or you like combination of both? Certainly, the patients with more severe condition may be on both. Uh, they may be on several different inhaled medications. Earlier, CO, er, milder COPD may only require uh, a simpler regimen. So you work that out with your doctor. Uh, most people with COPD need to see a lung specialist. I think they should. What do you think? Well, I think it's very reasonable, uh, certainly if the diagnosis is unclear, if, the, the, if you're short of breath and your primary care physician isn't quite sure why, then referral to a lung specialist for further evaluation is warranted. Uh, then once we see a patient with COPD and feel like we have their medicines kind of stable, then often we'll release them back to the primary care physician uh, for maintenance follow-up, and then they can send them back to us if they need to. Now, the more severe cases, often we will follow over time. You mentioned pulmonary rehab. Uh, tell me about pulmonary rehab. You can rehabilitate these people? Pulmonary rehab is a, is a structured program that lasts uh, about three months and it is monitored exercise uh, where patients with COPD, maybe requiring oxygen, maybe not, are gradually coached to do more activity under the care of rehab specialists and, and nurses to make sure it's done safely and it's proven to in, in the proper patient that to improve the amount that they're able to, to do. So you can really change the life of the person, Absolutely. allow them to be more active and more functional with pulmonary rehab. I think too many people neglect that right. part. Uh, outlook for these people? Um, you know, generally speaking, uh, the vast majority of folks with, with medication, with smoking cessation, uh, are able to live very functional lives. Uh, they may have some limitation in activity. Uh, there are selected patients who require oxygen and may actually have an improved quality of life if they wear oxygen because they can do more. And, and so I think it's one of those things. We don't talk about curing COPD. We talk about controlling COPD. So there's always hope and hope for improvement and hope of being better. James Shamia, you're a wonderful teacher, wonderful doctor. Thank you so much for coming to the Dr. Bob Show. Thank you very much. It's been great. Uh, had a pleasure being here.